and welcome. We are the Caligium Musicum. Tonight, we're bringing you an entertainment matching readings from the diary of Samuel Pepys with musical examples that he knew as a devoted amateur music musician. He played all of the instruments that you see here, and he loved to sing. He wrote his diary in the 1660s on the heels of the Cromwell era. And in spite of the theaters closing down and public spaces for entertainment, music did not die out. It simply retreated into the home. As Roger North said, some preferred to fiddle at home rather than go out and be knocked on the head abroad. For Pepys, a social occasion that involved eating and drinking was never complete without music. Some of the pieces are pieces that you know still today. Others took a lot of digging to find out what they were, but everything comes from diary entries, either composers that he knew and mentions, or specific pieces. I want to thank Carol Lukowski, our wonderful music librarian, who helped us track down some of the more esoteric pieces. And I want to thank Felicity, who facilitates everything. I want to thank I have a companion. Oh. <laughs> Without whom I could not have done this. I want to thank our voice teachers, Greg Saving and Kristen Lava, who are joining us this evening. I want to thank the students who have juggled Monday evening rehearsals with everything else. I also, of course, have to acknowledge Provost Andy Shannon, who is our Mr. Peace. <laughs> and finally, my good friend, Bob Strassler, historian. I've asked him to say, very briefly, a few words to introduce you to Mr. Peeps. I don't know, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's actually a little challenging to try to uh, tell you about Pepys in five minutes. Uh, he was a very, very Renaissance man and uh, was involved in many, many activities. Uh, I'll name a few and uh, those I miss, I'm just sorry, I miss. You, the, the, he's famous mostly for the diaries that he wrote. You'll get a little flavor from them for the, the, the introductions to each of the piece which are drawn are excerpts drawn from Pepys' diaries. Um, but he had another life. Uh, also, he was, uh, uh, you have to realize that in, he was born in uh, 1633. 16 years later, when he was a young, young man, uh, King Charles was beheaded uh, and executed by the parliamentarians. And uh, England became a sort of Puritan place to Oliver Cromwell, Thomas was his son. Um, for 16 years, and um, or no, 13 years, and until and I think it most most Englishmen felt a little uneasy about having uh, killed off the king, and they missed having a king, and also under Cromwell and the Puritans, it was it was doer and and difficult, and there all the music and all the fun had to go in the home, and you, you no parades, no bonfires, no. No, none of the good things in life that uh, England had been used to enjoying. And so one of the great things that happened was King Charles came back from France to England and took over the reign. And things just flourished outside in the external world. Music and theater and mass and parades and festivals uh, came back with, with uh, great, great uh, aplomb. And uh, Pepys was 
imagine he, 60, 20, 27 when the king came back. <laughs> And he was uh, in the Admiralty, working in the Admiralty already, so he could wangle his way, I presume. He, had, he didn't write about this uh, before he started his diary. But he could wangle his way on the boat that the, brought the king from France to uh, England with great ceremonial you know, fireworks and uh, celebrations. And uh, it clearly, he wrote, he mentioned it. It was, it was a, a major uh, element, uh, a major element. Uh, uh, item in his life, major event, and uh, there were several others I would mention. Uh, uh, there, there are at least uh, three or four that were critical. Um, there was a plague in 1665, the Great Plague in London and England, um, that had not been around for 100 years, 150 years, and so it was sort of a recrudescence, and it, it frightened everybody, and he wrote he wrote very movingly and well about that. Um, there was a, um, uh, a, a fire of, of London in 1666, I believe, and it burned half of the city, and people just watched in, in, in horror as they tried to get their goods out of their house, and, and, and nothing could stop it. Um, and it was a major event, and he wrote well about that. Uh, a third one was, the Dutch, who were at the time a, a rival of the British Navy, uh, with which he was still uh, working, came in 1667, and they sailed into the harbor where most of the British fleet was at anchor, and sailed off for the British fleet, or a large part of it, which was a great, great, horrible uh, shame to the, to the Navy, and I think helped to put him in a position where he could start to make the fleet into something important. The king didn't pay a lot of, the king was a bon vivant, and he was hard to get his attention for the Navy, but after the Medway disaster, um, he, Parliament gave lots of money for the Navy, and the king was ready to do it, and, and it just, it's, it, I believe it was a, a seminal moment uh, to get, get his career going. He ended up uh, being the, the, the head, uh, the chief of the, of the Admiralty, and um, he had a career that is not in his, you won't, you won't see it in his, his diaries, but he, he was, uh, he, 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 he uh, co uh, fought corruption, uh, he stopped the selling of uh, commissions, uh, or he reduced it, I mean that was something that was still going on in the army, for example, a hundred years later when Napoleon, in the Napoleonic Wars, you could buy your way into a colonelcy, you couldn't do that in the fleet because you had to come up through the midshipmen and he, said, he set this up. You had to be trained as a midshipman. You worked as a boy, 13, 14, 15, and you might have the right bloodlines, but you had to be good. You had to be able to navigate. You had to be able to learn all about the, the ships and to lead men. And um, this, you, we all know about the British, what happened to the British Navy. Under his, when he was there, when he, started, uh, there were 300, uh, I'm sorry, 30 ships of the line. Uh, each one is a major investment at the time, equivalent to, uh, uh, I don't know, a major uh, 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 military uh, investment that we make. And uh, when he left, there were 60 major ships of the line. And the British Navy had, was in ascendance in 1700 that would last it for 250 years. So he did a good job. He got rid of a lot of, he had made sure all the vendors actually sent, uh, sold quantity. People used to sell rotten food to the Navy. He stopped that and uh, he stopped uh, all, of the, all of the equipment that he bought, uh, that he, the Navy bought. He inspected, he had clerks he trained uh, so that there were records uh, of everything he could show for Parliament, how he spent every nickel. And of course, he was a bon vivant also, um, and in his position, he knew which ships were at sea, which meant he knew which women were home at night, um, and no men around. And he had a, a, he had a very nice, uh, he really, he had a nice wife, and he loved her, but uh, like many of his age, or any age, um, he had a, a, I don't say three, four, six, it's hard to tell, whether he paid them anything, he didn't say. But he, would, he could always say, well, I went over to Betty and, and spent, uh, spent time. And he was very, 
as you will maybe get the flavor, he was very honest about everything. And that's what makes his diary so wonderfully clear. They have they, all the entire um, society and the way they treated all them, each other and how they dealt with it and how he dealt with himself and his wife and the people he loved around him. It's all very clear and it, it's a wonderful picture and it takes you back to the 1660s, which was a time of great, great uh, change. Uh, under, under Charles, uh, the, who had Charles II, uh, who had six, uh, they, called, they formed the Royal Society. There were scientists. Uh, he was in the Royal Society. He was president of it for a while. And, you know, there were people in it like Newton. Yes, thank you. Um, Newton was there, and, and, they, and they knew each other, and, and, and they talked. There was Hook and Boyle and many, many great lights of science. And science was just beginning, the, the, and everything was changing. Newcomen was, was born and was working there, and that's the steam engine. And that turned England uh, into an industrial country in the 18th century. But so uh, all of these things happened in his time. And among other things, he loved music, he sang, he played instruments. And that was his major uh, joy in the evenings, other than eating and drinking good food and wine and women. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody now drinks the king's health without any fear, whereas before it was very private that a man dare be. Here, out of the window, it was a most pleasant sight to see the city from one end to the other with a glory about it. So high was the light of the bonfires, and so thick ran the city, and the bells rang everywhere.
night, I supped with W. Howe and Mr. Llewellyn in the great cabin below. After that, to bed, and W. Howe sat by my bedside, and he and I sang a song or two. And so, I to sleep.
having done, he fell to singing of a song, which he played himself well to the tune of the blacksmith.
ringing of bells, and drinking of the king's health upon their knees in the street, which methinks is a little too much. But everybody seems to be very joyful in the business, insomuch that our sea commanders now begin to say so too, which a week ago they would not do. Thank you. 
find my home, where my wife and her master were <coughs> dancing. And so I stayed in my chamber till they had done, and sat down myself to try a little upon the lyre of Iowa, my hand being almost out, but easily brought to again. So home, Sir William and I, and it being very hot weather, I took my flagellet and played upon the leads in the garden, where Sir W. Penn came out in his shirt into his leads. And there we stayed, talking and singing, and drinking great draughts of claret, and eating botago and bread and butter till twelve at night, it being moonshine. And so to bed, very near father.
Adrian's and all his company, and Mr. Borman and Mrs. Turner, but above all, my dear Mrs. Nip, with whom I sang. An imperfect pleasure I was to hear her sing, and especially her little Scotch song of Barbary Allen. <coughs> Oh, oh, oh. 
hear my Lord Lauderdale say himself that he had rather hear a cat mew than the best music in the world. And the better the music, the more sick it makes him. And that of all instruments, he hates the lute. What? <laughs> Next to that, the bagpipe. Oh, 
immediately returned from France, and is an absolute monsieur, as full of form and confidence and vanity, and disparages everything and everybody's skill but his own. The truth is, everybody says he's very able. But to hear how he laughs at all the king's music here, as Blagrave and others, that they cannot keep time, nor tune, nor understand anything, and that Grebu, the Frenchman, the king's master of the music, how he understands nothing, nor can play on any instrument, and so cannot compose, and that he will give him a lift out of his place, and that he and the king are mighty great, and that he hath already spoke to the king of Grebu, would make a man piss. <laughs> Oh, and I had but a fine man, a sweet man, a dainty man, and a spicy one. For now I lie by myself all alone, and the cold sweat calms me upon.
Among other things, Harris sung his Irish song, the strangest in itself, and the prettiest sung by him that ever I heard.
Oh,